Good morning again, everyone. It's wonderful to be in Lord's house this morning. Um, this next month, I'm going to be preaching about prophecy and the Bible, particularly prophecy about Jesus Christ. So that's called Christological prophecy, if you're wondering what the fancy theologians call it. But uh, before I preach that sermon series, I wanted to preach a sermon on prophecy in general so you'd be able to kind of get an, uh, a little bit of an understanding of what biblical prophecy is. Um, so our, my passage I want to go to today is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, but we're going to be going all over the Bible this morning, so just hold on to your seats. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. The Lord bless us reading of His word. Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have decided to speak to us, not just through nature and through, or through signs or interpretations. We don't need divination to know your will. You've given us the prophets, and you've given us your holy scriptures. Lord, as we dive into your word this this morning, help help us to know how you speak, who you spoke to, and what and how you're still speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you were to ask the average person on the street what prophecy is, let's say you talk, you ask five people what prophecy is, you're probably going to get five or ten different answers on what, on what prophecy is today. Uh, I asked my wife, and she's the most common, ordinary person I know. <laughs> I'm kidding, honey, you're gorgeous. And me. <laughs> Very profound. But she said, it is stuff foretold about Jesus in the Old Testament. Other people say that God still gives prophecy today and that they still receive dreams and visions and whatnot. Um, but if, if you do a, uh, an estimate on, on the prophecy given today, they say about 80% of prophecy is wrong. That's kind of astounding. But they say it still comes from God. And when you see modern day prophets, when you see them on the YouTube machine, and see, that's, that's supposed to be kind of funny because that's actually a website. Anyways, you see that, uh, you see really bizarre, sensual, crazy statements. Here's a modern day prophecy from a woman singing to some music. I feel a fire in my bones. Thank you, Jesus, just go in. I'm stepping into the garden with you, and I'm tasting of your fruit. She says that twice. I'm removing the scales off your eyes. And she says that twice. I see honey dripping from the tree of life. And she says that twice. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And she says it in a really sensual, provocative way. And she says that six times with some moaning and groaning here and there. There is a door and standing wide open... Standing wide open in heaven. She says that six times. It's the garden of delight. And then it gets more bizarre and bizarre from there. She's, it's amazing how bizarre these prophecies can get. But if anyone ever gets specific, like, it's, uh, like if Jesus will come back the next year, or, if, or we'll have a collapse of America the next coming year unless we do something really extravagant or give lots of money to this perfect. Or maybe the opposite end, they'll see a revival in America unless things change, if things change politically and whatnot. And every time they make these prophecies, it's always 100% wrong. 
last I checked, still things are a little bit worse than they were last year. There's no great revival coming. Last I checked, America's still holding on, even though it looks pretty bad. And this leaves us with the question, when we see all these different things going on, what is prophecy in the Bible? And how, and does it still continue today? You see, the passage we read earlier was talking about how God spoke to people. And in our, our series on Scripture, we, re, we learned that God speaks to us two different ways. From natural revelation through nature, we learn things about how God's mind works. We learn, that's how we're able to do science and to do logic because we see things consistent in nature. And we know how, God, how the mind of God works a little bit there. We also know that we have an all-powerful, omniscient God. And we also know about God through special revelation, particularly as it is revealed in the Bible. Now, before the Scripture was written, before, it was all, before all 66 books were in the Bible, God had to speak through people so that people would know what God's will was. And so that's what prophecy is. It is God speaking to people, through people. Now, God would authenticate His message by accompanying these prophecies with signs and with miracles. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18. Actually, funny thing, this is also a prophecy. Deuteronomy 18, we'll go to verse, uh, verse 20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. So these people who are predicting the coming of Christ at this particular time, and it doesn't happen. Don't listen to those people. If, you, if, they, if they say that they are performing signs and miracles and those miracles turn out to be false, don't listen to those people. There is a church in California called Bethel Church, and they were saying that they were having miraculous signs, and the, tr and the preacher was being drunk in the spirit and saying all kinds of gibberish, and telling people to live sensuously, and telling people to stop reading their Bibles because he's receiving revelation from the Lord, and he's the leader of this new apostolic reformation. And he's, he, he accompanied his, his great miracle was to have gold dust and feather, angel feathers fall from the ceiling. But we've already, we, we found out that people were putting glitter and feathers in the ventilation system and having it come out of the church. And the people knew that they were doing that. And when they got convicted and realized what they were doing was wrong, they left that movement. But that his heresy is still being said today and promoted in groups like Jesus Culture and Hillsong United. And that's where a lot of our contemporary worship music comes from. You see, God would authenticate His message with real signs and real miracles. With Abraham, he was 100 years old, and his wife was 90 years old, and they gave birth to Isaac. That was a miracle that showed God's providence. With Moses, we saw the ten plagues. We saw real signs and wonders. We saw him being able to take his hand and put it in his coat and have leprosy and then put it back and he didn't have leprosy. His 
staff would turn into a snake. That's a real sign and real miracle from God's prophet. And that's not the only signs and miracles he did, but he showed that he really did speak from the Lord. If we were to look at what prophecy is, it being God's statements to a people, and oftentimes it was predictions about what would happen in the future, 99% of all prophecy foretold events are fulfilled by the time the Bible was completed. About 20% of that was about Jesus. The 1% that's still left to be fulfilled is the return of Christ when God's going to judge the earth. It doesn't match this 80% good, 80% false, 20% rule that these modern day prophets are trying to tell us. You can tell those people are false prophets. But how did God speak to the prophets? To turn to the book of Numbers, we see a confrontation with Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Not the same Miriam that's uh, being watched by my father right now. But Numbers 12, verse 6 through 8. And this is God speaking. And he said, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with Moses. He is faithful in all my house. When I speak mouth to mouth, with him I speak mouth, uh, mouth to mouth clearly, not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why are you not afraid to, to speak against my servant Moses? And indirectly, that's kind of how God is telling us how he spoke to the prophets of the Old Testament. He spoke to them clearly. He spoke to them in, uh, unclearly sometimes in dreams and visions. He spoke to them with uh, typology. And he spoke to them with, with events and circumstances. He spoke to them in all kinds of different ways. He spoke to them in many times in many ways. Adam and Eve, he spoke clearly. Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15. He's speaking to Satan, but also Eve can hear, Eve and Adam could hear him. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's a clear, direct prophecy saying that he would send someone born of a woman, a descendant of Eve, who would crush Satan's head, and, and Satan would bruise his heel. And it was seen at the fulfillment of Christ when he died on the cross, and he broke Satan's power. He, broke, he, he, he reversed, started to reverse the curse. He, he saved people from their, from their sin. He speaks in dreams. Genesis 15. Genesis 15, verse 12. This is God's covenant with Abraham. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. They will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So, 400 years before the Israelites ever uh, were even thought, thought of as a nation. In a dream, God promised Abraham that his children would be in Egypt and be, served, and be slaves, and that they would come back to the land of Canaan, and that they would possess the land and name it Israel. He knew that 400 years before it was fulfilled. But it was in a dream. Also, God speaks in riddles sometimes. 
Genesis 49. This is Jacob's blessing. I'll read verse 8, 49.8. It says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. You see, that was a riddle, a poetry, it was a blessing, it was... It was there as kind of obscure, a lot of imagery, but when it was finally fulfilled in Christ, it was clear that Judah would, the kingship would come from Judah. That's why David would be, became, became king. And that the ruler's staff would not depart from him. There was kings all, all down through Israel's age until the last king before the Babylonian exile. But, even, but the scepter still didn't depart then because from Judah, from David, came Jesus Christ, who was the promised one, the one that would crush the serpent's head, the one that would, that would break his power, break the power of sin. And that was in a riddle or a poetry. Then there's also... Different types of, those are different types of God spoke then. He also spoke in visions. He also, does, there's also direct prophecy, prophecy that is not clear or unobscure. It's prophecy that is spoken directly, clearly, and does not have to be heavily interpreted. Abraham's dream was one of those. We could see clearly that Abraham, that Abraham would have descendants and they would be in a nation for, as slaves and then come back after 400 years. There's indirect prophecy, the prophecy that is hidden in poetry, requires heavily, heavy interpretation. It's sometimes, sometimes not realized until the event actually happens. Go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From my words of my groaning. This is Jesus' last words on the cross. And as you read Psalm 22, that he was, that you could count all his bones, his heart melted like wax, his, his, bone, or his bones were out of joint, that they divided his garments and cast lots for him. This is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And when you compare what the Gospels say to what Psalm 22 says, you can realize that this is actually a prophecy of Jesus. So that's indirect prophecy. There's also warning prophecy that's not specifically about Christ, but it's a warning to the people of Israel to repent of their sins. Isaiah chapter 1, which has a lot of... The book of Isaiah has a lot of prophecy about Christ, but it also has prophecy concerning Israel. It's not predictive. It's, it's, it's warning for them to repent. It says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Ch children have I reared and brought up, but they rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel, they are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, the whole heart is faint, from the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and and raw wounds, they are not pressed out, but bound up or softened with oil. God is relenting, and He's so 
heartbroken and angry over the sin of Israel at the time of Isaiah. And he's crying out against them. He's warning them that he's going to punish them for their sin if they don't repent. <clears throat> and then there's mountain range prophecy. Prophecy that looks like it's all one big event, but it actually occurs in stages. It's fulfilled in different stages. And that's we can see that in the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. Joel 2.28 Here's what it says. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. <coughs> your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens, and on the earth blood and fire and columns of smoke. The, earth, the sun shall be turned to blackness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the, of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is talking about a conglomeration of events here. Because in Acts chapter 2, Peter quotes, It shall come to pass for I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. That occurred at Pentecost. And several times in the apostolic era where the Holy Spirit was just pouring out on people, and they were telling biblical revelation, and they were, they were performing miracles and doing, and, and doing great things. It also talks about the end of the world here. It talks about the end of the world where God's going to finally judge and consume the earth. But it also talks about here that there will be no, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this is different events it's talking about. It's talking about Pentecost, it's talking about the end of the world, talking about our era right now where anyone who calls on the name of the Lord in the name of Jesus shall be saved. It's time and time and time. It, it, it's just it's a mountain range. You see a mountain, and then there's, you see an event, and then uh, there's like a valley beneath it you don't see in a hundred or a thousand years between the two different events, but it all looks like one big event. So that's different types of prophecy there. And there's also typology that's seen in events or people or things, and we see it all throughout the Old Testament. One of those events is in Genesis 22 at the sacrifice of Isaac where God told Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son that was a fulfillment of prophecy. And he told him to sacrifice him on a mountain that he chose where a lot of people say where the temple mount would, would, would come to be. And as he was about ready to kill his son, the Lord stopped him because he knew it was in his heart. And, and then he provided a ram that Isaac, or that, that Abraham used instead of Isaac. And he called the name of the Lord, the Lord provides. And then 2,000 years later, on a hill, God sent His Son, His only Son, to die for our sin. But His hand didn't stop that time. He didn't spare His own Son. He sent Him to die on a cross for our sin. We also see it at the Passover when, when Israel was in slavery. And the nine plagues had passed, and the last plague was to come. And the firstborn of all the of all the Israelites would have been killed if they didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And whoever had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, God passed over. That's a prophecy of Jesus. 
We see it in the, pre, in, the, in, the, in the order of the priesthood. We see it in the kings. We see all these different events and types and shadowings of Jesus Christ coming to fulfillment. So that's what biblical prophecy looks like. Sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect, sometimes it's in events, and sometimes it's in dreams and visions and riddles, sometimes it's directly. But when it was fulfilled, you always knew that it was from the Lord. You always knew its fulfillment. You always knew that it was from the Lord because real signs and real miracles accompanied it. That's what biblical prophecy is. So does it still continue today? My answer for you is only in the pages of Scripture. Because prophecy eventually was written down and became the Word of God. It was direct revelation from God to man about Himself, who He is, what He's done, what He will do. That's that kind of prophecy. The sign gifts were only to authenticate the scriptures. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 through 22, that's what we saw. Jesus commissioned the twelve apostles to do signs, and they were done in the book of Acts. And a scripture was written, and miracles grew, the, the need for miracles grew less and less. 1 Timothy 5.23 He tells Timothy this pretty interesting thing as he's giving him orders about, uh, about elders. It says in verse 23, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your ailments. There he's telling him to use medicine. If, he, if, the, prophets, if, the, mirac if the miracles of healing were, were directly needed... He should have told him, I'm going to come over and heal you. Or I'm going to speak a word and heal you. That's not what happens. He also left a disciple ill. A lot of people were sick and almost died when Paul was in prison. And they came to him and ministered to him. And he ministered to them. And church history tells us that after the death of John in AD 95, the prophecy, the prophecy and the miracle gift cease. John Christosom in the 3rd century said, The whole place is very obscure, but the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to and by their cessation, having such as then used to occur, but now no longer take place. Augustine said that speaking in tongues was actually speaking from one human language to another human language. If I was speaking in English and some, and, and all, if I was an English speaker and I spoke Spanish without ever knowing Spanish and the Spanish speaker would understand, that's what the gifts were seen. That's what we see in Pentecost. But he said that those ceased. And in fact, the only time we actually see somebody trying to say miracles are happening still today first time it occurred was a hundred years ago in 1901 by a Bible study in a, in a holiness church with Charles Parham. He was a con artist. And he said that they were speaking in tongues, that they were speaking real languages, that they were speaking, almost speaking, they started, someone started speaking in Chinese, he thought. And so... They sent these people who were speaking real, actually gibberish, but thought they were speaking in, in different languages because they thought it sounded like their accents. They sent them as missionaries over to these countries, and they were left out of the countries because they were told they were speaking gibberish. That's why the need for actually learn the, the language of another people group is important. But the same people who were from Charles Parham's Bible study that were trying to continue this, they decided to reinterpret it, and reinterpret it and say, oh, it's an angelic language or it's a prayer language. Now, that, that church is, a, it, I think it was actually a church. It's not just some hoax.
because people were actually preaching the gospel. But what they were doing in the speaking in tongues, what they were, what they were doing in that is, is, is not biblical. It's not reality. And this is the same movement that's the modern prophecy movement or the new apostolic reformation as they like to call themselves because they're saying that there's new apostles today and there's new prophets today. I want you to be aware of them because they are saying the scripture is not sufficient. Now this isn't all we need. That we need new experiences and new revelation from God. It's not the case. Because all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete for every good work. This is all we need because this is a, our sword. It is living and sharper than any actual two-edged sword. This is what we need. We need the Word. We need it in our lives. And we need to use it to hold other people who are against people who are in error. We need to use it to, to show this power and spirit, spirit of our God. I'm not saying God doesn't still heal today. That's, that's not true. God still heals today. God still, God still leads people in right directions. God still points people back to His Word. God still opens people's eyes. But it's not done through me laying hands on somebody. And me using my power of healing to do that. It's not done through, through me telling somebody a special word from God. Because the only special word from God is the Bible. That's hard for some people to swallow. And I, I, I hope that we still hold true to our, to our confession. That we can have differences of opinion in theology. But we need to be standing on the Word of God. We need to be standing on the sentience. 2 Peter 21 says, For no prophecy of Scripture was produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. This is true. Let's hold fast to the Word of God and not be swept up in the swift destruction of false teachers. Don't look for your best life now because that's not what Scripture promises. We have an eternal reward in heaven. God promises suffering and persecution for anyone who desires to live a godly life. Don't believe that that false teacher, if they tell you that if you give the money, that you'll get a thousandfold in reward full of money in return. That's not a promise in Scripture. That's their own twisted imaginations. Don't believe the pro false prophets when they say that Jesus was just a man and you can and you he was just as much God as you are and if you just have enough faith and you just speak it that you're going to be a, a a little God and God will have to listen to you. That's not scriptural. Beloved, hold fast to the Word of God. Believe the prophecies in the Bible, not these false prophecies that are happening today. Stand in the inerrant, infallible, sufficient Word of God. Because it's the only thing that's true and right. It's what will hold you to the course. And when... You go up to heaven. God will say, Well done, good and faithful servant, because you stood to his word. You loved Jesus. You did what he prescribed. He'll say, Good and faithful servant, because he loves you. Please don't listen to these false teachers who are trying to drag you away from God's word. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. And that by it, we can be aware of false teachers. Know your will. Know yourself and your son. Thank you for letting us know that you are sure by proving yourself to be sure. Thank you for giving us a book that has 
percent fulfilled prophecy. It's the only book that has any fulfilled prophecy. And thank you for leaving that one percent by promising that you will still that you will return and make all things new. Because you have been true in the past, we know that you'll be true in the future. Help us to trust in it and study it and memorize it and love your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page 62. saved by works, but help us to go out and do them because of your rich love for us. Help us to know you more because of your rich love for us. It's in Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen.